What would you do if you found yourself and your children homeless? Do you want to cultivate a parent-child relationship you are proud of? Do you understand why your children actually won't listen to you when you're yelling? Do you know how to deepen the connection with you and your child without actually having to spend more time with them? And how to implement a boundary without feeling the guilt hangover? Do you understand the difference between punishment versus consequence? And do you know what to do when you and your partner want to parent differently? I'm answering all of these questions in a super simple, easy, and effective parenting mini course on understanding your children's behavior. We start June 17th, and guess what? It is only $27. So head on over to momisincontrol.com forward slash sign up and learn about the details. Hey ladies, I'm back and today I'm super excited to share with you an interview, a very candid interview with a woman, um, what we call her Coach Tulin. And so you might hear some background noise. I'm uh, recording this outside. And actually, I was supposed to be sharing this podcast episode yesterday, and the stars did not align. So progress, not perfection. Um, Didn't beat myself up. And I also just wanted to give you permission not to do the same. I think this is a really, really important conversation that we need to be having. I met to Lynn. We actually connected on Instagram. I've been following her uh, for a little while now. She has a podcast that's called Fit Has No Size. She talks about her journey from losing over 100 pounds, um, you know, from her uh, business journey, her health journey, her personal development journey or motherhood journey with her family and how her and her husband lost everything and they were found homeless. And I just love, I was really attracted to this woman's determination to just keep going. I found that really important and inspiring because too often I'm like, what makes, you know, this person unique? Like why can this person, um, you know, persevere and other people just give up? And the truth is, course there's like a huge cement truck that just pulled up while I'm recording this Um, part of it is really focusing on your why why are you doing the work what do you want to achieve in your life and how willing are you to chronically look at your thoughts and your beliefs on a daily basis and say not today Satan I am going to turn this ship around and take strategic action in alignment with how I want to feel so this is why I was so so inspired um, to reach out to to Lynn and to connect with her um, and I think you're going to be inspired as well so again her podcast is fit has no size and she is she talks about all things related to those plus size and on their journey to fitness, from fitness to fashion to personal development. She is a motivator, a mentor. She advocates for those starting or re-engaging in fitness. Her mantra is fit has no size and is dedicating to bridging the gap between those that are plus size and the health and fitness industry. She's always been a supporter of uh, plus size, having been a plus size model, consultant for several uh, brands, and um, she believes that you know, there shouldn't be this before and after picture. And I found it really interesting to talk to her because I've never been plus size, but a lot of my journey through fitness has, um, is very parallel to what she teaches because, you know, it's like you have to be, um, obese or overweight to engage in, in fitness and nutrition. And really it's a deeper conversation of health and vitality and wellness. And I think, um, yeah, this was a beautiful conversation. So let's dive in. Welcome coach to Lynn. Hi, I'm so excited to have you here. I've been following you on Instagram. I love your just, what do they call you? Kick ass, badass. You're just taking a stand for how you want to feel in your life. And not too many people I find are doing that these days. So I'm super excited for you to share your story and your journey with the mom is in control community. Well, thanks for having me. I'm super excited. I think it's what you call, um, don't be half ass, use your full ass. So I'm like badass, kick ass. Oh my gosh. That's a good one. I haven't heard that before. I haven't either. I just made it up right now. Get, 
to, we have to buy the domain now. <laughs> yeah, before before the uh, episode goes out. That's right. Awesome. So I told you this before I hit record that one of the reasons why I really resonated and connected with you is I'm so passionate about women. I, I'm so attracted to women who are like, fuck this. This is not going to be my situation. Also, your whole brand is around fitness and body image and like do your own thing, be you. So just kind of taking it back a little bit, but you and your family used to be homeless as well. Like so many things. So just like, I don't, I want to say in a nutshell, but just let it all out. What well, brought so, you here? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really funny because the last thing I had was any control of anything and just desperately trying to hold on to a lot of things. You know, it's funny as I look back at my journey and where we've come and all the things I've gone through in my life, there's always this sense of loss. It's not the first time I've been without a home. It's not the first time we lost everything. Kind of, as I go through my own journey and my own personal healing, um, you know, more and more of it makes more sense or I have a different relationship with from when I was younger. But um, gosh, I don't even know how many years ago it was now, but we're definitely in the 10 year loop because we always said it would take us about 10 years to come out of it. Uh, my husband and I and our two little boys ended up broke and homeless. Uh, my husband had built an incredible business online. He had a business partner who couldn't handle his success, threatened the lives of all 40 employees, including ourselves, on Christmas Eve. It was that night. We sent all the employees home. They didn't know what was happening, and we barricaded ourselves in the office. We're 11 miles away from home. We call the local police, tell them what's going on. They said, we can't show up until he showed the firearm no problem. We uh, changed all the locks on the office. We changed the code between where the offices were and the warehouse because we could hear the metal doors. If you have, and we barricaded ourselves in the entire night. And I told my husband, I said, I'm here, you know, we're going to get through this. Well, there's no manual on going broken homeless. And there definitely isn't like, don't talk to other people about it who haven't been there because they'll say, well, why don't you just buy a cheaper car? Or why don't you just move to a cheaper place? And that only comes from people who don't know what it's like to have lost it all or to still be driving your amazing Z4, but not know that there's pennies going into the tank because there's no money coming in and we're, we're trying to make ends meet. And so the car doesn't, the car is there because the repo man hasn't come and got that one nor two other cars. So we went through hell and back and I'll never forget. When we finally realized that we were losing our place. I have two little boys, a husband with multiple sclerosis. He lost his ability to walk for two years due to the stress and uh, the night before we were leaving, we backed our minivan into the garage and we're ready to go the next morning. And we didn't want the kids to see the sheriff come to the door. We didn't want them to have a, a bad experience or, you know, not really understand what's going on. It's got to be very scary for two little kids. And as soon as we're ready to leave, the car dies in the garage the next morning. It's like 7 a.m. Like, how are we going to get out of here? Yeah. There were so many things that were happening. We found a neighbor that could, um, you know, help us get our car restarted. I remember driving away and my husband and I just taking this deep breath, like, okay, that's behind us now. Um, and we left so much in the house. Like if it couldn't be sold, it stayed. I mean, I still have a wedding ring to this day. Like I, I can tell you the stages of the selling of the, we the wedding ring and the diamonds and the gold that, that fed our kids that, that kept a roof over our head. And so we started this quest to, rebuild our lives. And there's something really beautiful about losing everything in hindsight. It gives you a clean slate to um, work from. But what people don't understand is that there are consequences and domino effects from that. You go from having made no money to all of a sudden making money and you know trying to turn that corner. And there's all these things I feel like that we experience as a family so that we could be, um, so we could fulfill our purpose. That's where all this kind of was born from this, this mm -hmm. version that you're seeing online. And we turned it into a venture, an adventure for our kids. We had gained 180 pounds between the two of us. Um, and I am, um, super, super, super competitive. I think I gained like 80 of that or hundred of that, something like that. I hit 375 pounds, we finally got an apartment after living in a little hotel that we were like barely paying for, paying the car note on our car just in case we needed a place to live. Found an apartment that didn't judge us by our numbers, which is like, hallelujah, like somebody yeah. not judging us by the size of my pants, my credit score. It let us in. It had mice. We didn't care. It was on the second floor. My husband's literally dragging his body up the stairs. Mm. I'm ashamed to admit that I can't even walk up the stairs without my heart beating out of my chest and the, and the blood pressure in my ears and losing every ounce of oxygen in my, in my lungs. And that was by the 12th step. I felt like I was going to like pass out. 
where do you start? What do you do? I remember working 40 hours. I'm sorry. What am I saying? 40 hours. That would be lucky. 18 hour days, Mm -hmm. 48 hours straight at the end of every single month, making what averaged out to $2 an hour. Wow. And, not, and I have quite a background, so is my husband, and not caring because it was about making sure that my kids were taken care of. And so that's where we started, this, this chapter we've been sharing online. And when I started sharing this, it really was from a place of my husband looking at me and saying, friends don't let friends die. I had, I had a circle of people around me that at the time, if you loved yourself, you didn't care if you worked out or um, what you ate. And me starting to take care of myself publicly with very little following at the time um, was somehow going to damage them, wow. their goals and their intentions and entire industry. So I kind of went against a few voices in the plus size industry, as well as the health and fitness industry, because I didn't fit in either place. Like there wasn't representation of someone like me at the time. I'd love your perspective of like you had to create space for yourself. You were like, there is no other way. We are at the bottom, clean slate, have to start over again. And it's not going, where do I fit in? Who's going to give me a job? How are people going to help me pay the bills? It's like, no, you shared your journey, you created space. And so what I'm hearing you say is when you started to do that, people were like, who are you to do this? Very much so. As a matter of fact, so this is going back several years. So there was a time that people in in like who were plus size models or working in the plus size industry, they couldn't share their workouts or talk about it. They would have people turn their back to them. They would make an assumption that you were saying that you didn't love yourself before. And that's not what the industry is about. Let me say that. The industry is actually really an amazing heart. It's where a lot of us go and learn to love ourselves where we are. But there was a there was an interesting shift there for a moment, definitely with agendas. Um, and so when I went doing this, I needed to see another body in motion like mine. Did somebody else's belly apron get in the way? Did somebody else do the whole thing that they literally could not move their center of gravity off the couch and have to like roll over on their belly and slide down their knees and then decide which knee was going to bear the brunt of the 375 plus pounds? Or was anybody else on the floor trying to do a crunch and they would feel the inside of their body move, but the rest of their body was still on the floor. Or the idea of raising their knee just a few inches would raise my belly apron through my middle that was well over 60 inches, took two measuring tapes to measure, come up through my chest, up through my neck, and a simple knee raise made me feel like I was suffocating. Laying on my back was impossible. I'd have to lay on my side and hug pillows to keep my chest open so I can breathe. And I, I can't walk up a New York City block And, you know, I went looking online. I'm like, there's got to be other people dealing with this. And all I saw were before and afters, people who hated themselves before and who loved themselves in the after, but I wasn't seeing the journey. And I wanted to start from a place of self-love because I recognized this idea of negative mindset, speaking negatively to myself, the absolute hatred that I had for myself that I deserved all this because my opinion wasn't my own. It was based on everyone else's. Um, I went looking for her and I couldn't find her. So when I couldn't find her, I became her, not knowing I'd become her for. I'm literally sitting here like, like, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm choking back tears because it's so true. It's, it's the inner journey that happens, right? People see that transformation and they're like, how did you get from point A to point B? But they don't realize it's not just as many crunches that you do and all of that stuff. So can you go back to maybe that moment, like how long have you been sharing your journey publicly? Um, so I've always had some level of sharing my journey publicly over the past 15 years, whether I was a plus size model, I became the national spokesman for the largest PCS organization. This is all prior to us going broken homeless. Um, and so I've always, I've actually was reminded that I've been advocating for women since I was an um, anorexic teenager. Um, So this has been ongoing for a while, but with social media taking off the way that it has, I've been really sharing this journey online for the past eight years um, with no following and actually no intention to create a following, no, no intention to create a business or a purpose. Honestly, it was a place that I could go and create a little accountability for myself in a little area that was separate from everyone else, feeling very alone, very unloved, very unworthy feeling like I'm failing at life. And it was just, it was just my way to show up for myself daily. That was all it was. Yeah. This is what I really like. I I never wanted to be a business owner. I didn't, I never, I didn't even understand what entrepreneurship was, but I kept looking at my boys. They're 14, nine and six now. And when my oldest was four, 
you know, I was a social worker, come home and I'm screaming and yelling and I'm looking at him and I'm going, I don't understand to help. I don't, I don't know how to help you with your anger and outbursts. I don't understand how to help you with your anxiety. And here I am telling other people what to do with their parenting. And I'm like, this is out of alignment. And the second I started talking about it, everyone's like, yeah, me too, me too. And I'm like, why is everybody, you know, putting this behind closed doors? Like, guys, this is a huge cultural disconnect. And we're all dying inside, but yet we're pretending we're alive and just like, you know, put on the red lipstick and we're good to go. Um, what kept you going though? Like, what was the moment when you were like, I just need to keep moving forward after you've kind of had to start fresh? You know, I want to speak on what you just said real quick about when you came home, we screamed in the house a lot. Um, our kids knew tension and anger a lot. One of the greatest compliments I received in this past year is my husband said, you've become a more patient mother. That's growth. And our kids have learned more from watching us pick back up in the struggle than they see what we do, not do what we say. And they've watched us. They they learned about personal responsibility, that struggle and overcoming it, knowing that they can achieve whatever is they dream because they watch their parents fall flat on their butt and bounce and fall again and get back up and fall and get back up. They have that example every single day. And I watch both my kids, my son who couldn't read in first grade, become top of his class in reading by second grade, now reads, um, I think, second year college, and he's in fifth grade. My oldest son, who was told he'll never play basketball, horribly bullied, punched like in the hips with big, you know, bruises on his hips, being told he'll never make it, made it to high school basketball. One of two kids brought up to varsity. Now this year he's playing college basketball. Wow. None of that would have been possible if we didn't go through what we went through. So the moment for me was um, I wanted to live because I knew I was dying. I knew that I, I, it wasn't about the weight loss anymore. It wasn't about um, vanity. And I'm not going to say there's not something really wonderful that comes from taking care of yourself from the inside out that begins to reflect. Your skin begins to glow. How you hold yourself is differently. There's a different energy that radiates from you. It's a light that you can't fake and you can't dim. It just radiates from you. Um, but I recognized uh, when I had my friends tell me, what you do is bad for plus size women. Mm. And you share your journey online. It was, the, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And my husband looked at me and said, friends don't let friends die. And with no money in our pocket, with the only check that was being sent to us that we were literally having it sent to us via Western Union, just to have cash in my pocket, just to, just to keep the lights on another month or just to keep us in the apartment for another month or to get food in the kid's belly. I'm like, well, I'm not going anywhere yet. I'm gonna go take care of myself. I wanted to live. And I watched my husband, we were broken homeless on his knees, working out with weight training. This guy was 19 years old and got diagnosed at UCLA while he was a football player. And he had nothing else left. His, his, uh, his family's in the position they are, frankly, because of his business. And while he was on the up and up, his partner wasn't. But the bottom line is you're the CEO. You know, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we, we're part of the consequences. All of that had to happen to make room for the rest of our life, which we recognize now. But I remember watching him on his knees and being so inspired, understanding the power of modification. When his legs wouldn't hold him, his arms could lift. And he just started training like this. And I was the unsupportive spouse that was afraid that as he progressed, there wouldn't be space for me. And so he was really a huge inspiration in everything that we're doing right now. And if he was so fighting so hard to live because at some point he was not wanting to anymore, if he was fighting so hard to live, what was my excuse? And I think just somewhere a new fight and a new fury came out of us that if we want to make change, nobody's going to come save us. And if it could just come from a place of being about health gains and let weight loss be the byproduct, but that wasn't our focus. It was just, we wanted to live and be able to walk up the steps and be there for our kids. That was the big aha for us. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. (laughs) You you lost me. I'm trying. (laughs) I know we're trying to hold it, but this is why I said no video today, audio only. Um, you lot, I, yeah, you had me at, I wanted to live. So I tell this story all the time. Um, I did a TEDx talk called dying to be a good mother. And I didn't know what my message was, right. I didn't know what my message was. I just kept sharing and sharing. And then as I'm trying to, uh, figure out my talk, I'm like, what was that moment? And there was a moment in the bathroom 
when I was going through chemo and treatment and I'm bald and barely alive and I'm shitting and puking at the same time. And I'm sitting there crying in fetal position. It's two o'clock in the morning, making sure no one hears me. I don't want my boys to wake up. My husband will, will be snoring, but my boys, especially my oldest would be up just like that. Like I can hear you, mom, what's up? Yeah. And I'm like, you're going to die. You're going to die. It was just paralyzed fear. And there was this little voice. I was like, Heather, you're not fucking dead yet. And I'm like, but I don't know how to live. I don't know how to feel alive. And so that was my mission. I was like, I need to learn how to feel alive. And I remember going, what do happy people do? What do alive people do? What does energy look like? And so I'd watch people and like, well, someone's on a bike. I'm like, these people go to coffee shops and sit there and like write in a journal. So I, I did that one time and I'm like, this sucks. I don't know who invented going to a coffee shop by yourself and sipping on a coffee and journaling. This sucks. But I realized it's all that shit and conditioning that's layers on top of us. And we have to let that go and unlearn it in order to find that aliveness in us. And I see so many women now, how to get my kid to do this, how to get them to respect me. I'm like, you need to start fucking respecting yourself. You need to start like, how do I get them to calm down? How do I'm like, guys, we're overscheduled. We are, there's so much bullshit that we've bought into and you want, you want to feel alive. You want that energy. You want to feel purpose in your life, but yet you've numbed yourself from feeling. So first you need to feel it all. I see that excited you. Uh, Girl, if you really asked me, what did you start to do? I started to feel. Now you and I are very much alike. We're two women. We have blood rolling. I mean, we have the same organs and whatever, you know, for the most part, whatever the situation is. And I'm an appendix. You have an appendix. But I mean, the bottom line is- I have an appendix. All right. I mean, we're, we're, we're two human beings having a human experience. So everything about us is the same. The difference is, is you're blonde. I'm brunette. I'm larger. You're smaller. But here's the thing that's very interesting. The journey and the size of our journey is not determined by the size of our body. And the struggle is the same regardless of what end of the size spectrum you are on. And the thing that so many of us struggle with is this idea of feeling. And I tell the ladies I work with, because I work with mostly plus size women, that we wear our stories in our body. And no matter how much I try to make an extra large pizza, pizza from Domino's and three haagen bars look sexy in a wine glass, there was nothing socially acceptable about food. And I, I remember I did a podcast and, um, this person said to me, Oh, so you ate to feel better. I'm like, no, no, no. I ate to numb. And I was uncomfortable with feeling positive feelings as well as negative feelings. So I just chose not to feel at all, which was to me, and I've never been in this position, but it, to me, it's the equivalent to me of having a needle in my arm. And when I sat down to feel, and I thought for some reason you had to be positive all the time or happy all the time. Well, happiness is fleeting and you can find joy in any of the moments. And I read that somewhere. I cannot remember where I read it. It's not my words, but I remember it really spoke to me and getting comfortable with feeling one way or the other, being okay with feeling negative or being okay with feeling sad, making the decision to feel so I could feel alive and to be okay with feeling those feelings and recognizing this is just part of my experience. And so once I got there, I mean, it's so interesting. I think so many of us just are afraid to feel. So we numb. Yeah. Yeah, And it's, I hear that all the time from like, my kid did this, I'm losing my shit. Or, you know, my life is falling apart and I'm like, feel it, feel it. And, and it's the judgment that we have based on that story, right? Like this is bad. And I'm like, there is a time when you would not let yourself feel this, but we have, it's like the light and the dark, the contrast, the yin and the yang. And I can't tell you so like, yeah, when you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And then you're like, yeah. you can, but all of a sudden, or like, I've lost it all. And look how much money I, it, it is literally money's very interesting. I found that like when you have none and then you get it, you're like, this is legit what they say it is not about the money, right? You're like, no, it is about the feeling and the freedom. So how do you get there? So can you talk a little bit more about, um, I don't know, maybe what you're personally challenged with right now, like some of your journey of, I'm sure there's levels that you've gone through, right? Like through the body, through the food and, and kind of what you're noticing coming up. Yeah. So, I mean, the important part about this is understand it's a journey. Um, I was just in Sedona a couple weeks ago for a mastermind and we were all kind of in, doing impromptu meditation in this vortex, which is super cool. My, my inner woo is starting to come out. Like I'm kind of, woo. I'm right very now. woo. I'm very woo. Love it. 
I'm getting it. I've got crystals behind me. I've got candles. I've got sweet. I mean, like I'm getting into it and I'm loving how it feels. And so we did this impromptu uh, meditation in at Rachel's Knoll, this vortex in Sedona. And after we all opened our eyes and I was looking at all, and I, I noticed this in art. Like if you look at art really up close, super messy, same thing. Look at all the cracks, the boulders, the lumps, the bumps, um, the texture, all these things like nature's cellulite. Yet we look at it as being so majestic, but when we see it in our own bodies, right? It's like, oh, it's, it's not okay, but this is what we're meant to do. This is why we're meant to stand boldly in exactly who we are at this moment. I totally forgot your question. I don't know, but I was just... When you talked about oh. like nature cellulite, I was like, that is fucking brilliant. It is. It's nature cellulite. I remember what you said. I'm back. Okay. So the thing about this journey is, is that it really is about ups and downs. So if somebody was looking at, at the end of the day, a lot of people are still chasing weight loss. Okay. They want to look at another way around it. But at the end of the day, if you ask them in a very supportive you know, environment, that you're not going to judge them. What do you ultimately want? I just want to lose weight. So happiness begins there, right? Now it happens in the journey. And so this journey, much like nature, like, like nature had to be patient to have that majestic, you know, red rock, the way that it is, it took patience. It took conflict. It took, um, it took, you know, weather it took, it took, it, it, you know, whatever it took all these really, really, really harsh elements to create something so beautifully imperfect. And so there have been times I've been frustrated by my journey because again, here's another financial situation again, because last year, about 18 months ago, I got knocked on my butt with shingles on my face. So I went partially blind. I couldn't hear anything. Um, and here I am, we just moved into our house that we're in right now after living in our apartment for all those years with the mice, with, we moved into another apartment in the same place. But I mean, we, we sacrificed a lot to rebuild our lives. And the second we moved in this house, I lost my mind. I got hit with the deepest, darkest depression and anxiety I've ever felt. It manifested itself physically, but the universe was knocking on my shoulder so much saying, you are, you are living this too, and you are doing all these things. You are, you know, practicing what you preach by making sure you make yourself a priority. But somewhere along the way as mom, especially as mom, who's, presence is really important to the overall health of the family financially, I got knocked down. So the universe knocked me on my butt. Five and a half, six months, I couldn't work. I took us back on the brink of being broken homeless again a year ago. And I recognized that I was looking at this going, oh my God, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. And I saw something. You are so afraid and living so much in the fear that you were manifesting this and you're not seeing as my uh, mentor says, James Wedmore, that your success is inevitable. And I was going back to what was comfortable in the fear and I became frozen. But I do believe the universe did that for me. So again, I had another blank slate to say, I need you to see what's possible. I want you to see where you're going. But in order to get you to do the things that you want that align with how you want to feel, it feel fun to you. I have to take everything away for a moment. You have to sit in the dark, see the light. And so we've spent this past year rebuilding my health. I got back within like, I was 299.6 um, as far as my weight shot back up. My waist was again over 60 inches because I was just like swelling up. I was gaining 10 and 20 pounds in a week, but somehow it was okay. So May 23rd of this year was the one year fit anniversary that I had, not as like starting day one, but that day that I was finally able to get up and keep moving and started from a place of self-love taking care of myself before anyone else and doing things that aligned with how I wanted to feel. How did I want to feel? And I think what was so impactful about that is I could see everything I've been through before, all the ups and downs, all the things had accumulated to help me be able to get back on my feet in five and a half, six months, be here a year from now, completely shift the way I do my business, completely shift the way I see my life. It literally pulled some things out to make room for what's coming into my life right now. And so when people look at this transformation, this journey, you're supposed to go through the shit. Yeah. You're supposed to have the setback. You're supposed to have the experience because now you have the data sets from how you dealt with it before to make a choice in this moment now being versus being reactionary to now being proactive and say, how do I choose to feel right now? Do I choose to feel this? And what do I have control over? What don't I? Do I choose to make this bad moment into a bad year, bad life, whatever? Am I willing to give my power away to other people or circumstances? Am I going to keep being a victim of my circumstance or am I going to grab it by the nutsack and keep moving forward? I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's like, what do you want to do right now? And sometimes like, 
I'm just going to pity party for a minute. Good. Have it. Have at it with a pity party. But if you want to move forward, the only thing's going to move you forward, make the difference, is you showing up for you and recognizing how far you've grown and you have a choice to deal with whatever it is you're dealing with right now. It doesn't go away. How you deal with the adversity, how you view to look at the situations, becoming fascinated and curious about it's what happens in the journey. And now when things quote unquote go wrong or quote unquote bad things happen as I air quote, nobody can see me doing it. I now go, all right, door shutting. I'm not really loving this, but I'm only in control of things that I have. I'm really freaking here. I'm excited about the door that's about ready to open. Yeah. Like all of this has purpose. And so I'm recognizing the purpose in this journey and I'm actually okay when things don't go as planned, because I get to where I want to go, just not in the way that I thought I would. Oh my gosh. I'm like, amen. Amen. (laughs) I love, you build that toolbox, but you build that resiliency and then you're like, great, awesome. And the second I let go of the fact that you actually arrived somewhere and you're like, oh good, you know, the race is done. Um, No, but you have, they call it the dark night of the soul, right? Or everyone has their own version of what it is, but the contrast, I'm now incredibly grateful for contrast when something doesn't show up because I'm like, Oh yeah. Wow. Great. Like I remember when that used to be my everyday experience and now it's just once in a while or, um, you know, you, you, you learn as you go. I will never, ever forget financially. Um, after I was in recovery and I was looking at my husband, like, you know, you got this right. And he, you know, just based off his behavior, it was like, no, I don't got this. And I'm like, fuck, if I want to figure this shit out. And now I'm lit up like a Christmas tree. I'm like, ladies, Mm -hmm. you need to make money. We need some independence here and we need to know what's going on and everything is energy. And the more we love ourselves, the more we value ourselves, the more we lift ourselves up, the more we lift other people up. And I don't have my shit together. I'm still trying to pick through like, why am I, why do I feel heavy today? Why, Mm -hmm. you know, why, what's going on with the energy? And as you up level, do you find this too? Cause I know you, I don't know your woo-woo perspective, but I notice that when I'm up leveling, like, oh shit. And I say yes to another level, I'll get sick. I usually get like a cold or something. And it's, I'm like, I get excited now instead of going, what's going on? Cause before it used to be fear-based. I'm like, yeah. my body is just cleansing of this old energy. 100%. Because on the year of my one year fit anniversary of getting back, I actually am grounded from working out right now. So you can't, I don't know if you see this. I can't. I've been seeing that on your Instagram. You're like, okay, I got to change. Yeah, right. I can't lift the shoulder, but, and I was like, gosh, this really kind of sucks. And I, I didn't like, um, I don't like track on a daily, this, this journey. I accidentally sat down on day 100. I had my calendars and I marked off day 100. I'm like, wow, this is 100 days of committing to myself, my nutrition, my hydration, my fitness in a way that aligns layer by layer, not this all or nothing thing. And so as I was coming to the one year anniversary, I was like, wait a minute, I'm on the eve of my one year anniversary. I'm grounded from working out, recognizing this whole thing I had going on in my arm and my shoulder were actually coming from where I carry my tension Mm. and my stress. And as soon as I had it working on the toxic release, the toxin release, I should say, literally was having me in bed like 12 hours a day. And I was able to sit quietly with it. And I recognized like, two days ago, and I don't know if you saw that, not that you're reading all my posts, but I actually talked about it and I said, it's really interesting because on the eve of this and all this personal growth that I've had, that just kind of accumulating, I find it interesting that now my body is choosing to give me this thing that's going to hold me back just for a moment. It's going to slow me down just for a moment to physically release all the tension, the struggle, the stress, everything that I carried in my neck and shoulders, that now my body is ready to release it. And this was its hint to me saying, hey, here's the residual, get to the root of things. Take this time in your season to slow down because y- you have to make room for what's coming, which is a monumental mind shift. Mm. And in all of this, still on point in my nutrition in the way that makes sense for me, that fuels me, that doesn't leave me feeling deprived, that actually makes me feel better because the more aligned I eat to who I am and where I am, guess what? Many of the things that I struggle with emotionally begin to fade away. So direct connection, same thing with hydration, something as simple as being hydrated can remove levels of depression, anxiety. I'm not saying it's a cure. I'm just saying that some of these very simple things that we have in our lives can make a difference. 
be very it's supportive in our very. In our so I'm not negative about it. I'm like, it's okay. And I recognize, I'm like, what a beautiful way for me to have a tangible experience to say your body's letting go of all of those years mm-hmm. and that toxic release in my body. Like after having the acupuncture and the fire cupping and the work they did, I just stayed really present in it. Even in the pain of them working on me, I just learned to sit and breathe and recognize it'll be over soon. This is making space. I love this. I like your perspective. It's all... I mean, yeah, the, the opposite perspective doesn't get us anywhere. We just go oh. down a deep, dark rabbit hole. Been there. <laughs> going through, yeah, going through this journey, uh-huh. what do you, you know, being a mother, mm. um, I used to think, oh, I got to save up for their college education. Now my son's like, I'm getting a, I'm going to get a, um, a van and just travel and bike for a while after high school. I'm like, go for it. That sounds rad. Yeah. I'm like, I'd rather, I'd rather get you a life coach yes. than pay for post-secondary education. So yes. I'm just curious how your perspective has shifted on what quote unquote air quotes a good mother is and what, you know, this whole, what your perspective and definition is of parenting and feeling in control. So I recognize that no matter what I do and how I grow, my parents, my, my parents, my kids are going to need therapy. They're going to be sitting across from a therapist at some point and saying, mom, this, or, you know, I, I had this experience, like my little one, my youngest one, and when we broke, went broken homeless, you know, he has some things, some food things that come up and he eats in the bathroom and he, and he hides food. And I think the story that he tells himself is that we struggled feeding him, which was actually the opposite. So he's attaching a story to something and I'm seeing it. For us, we want our kids to have experiences. Um, We would like for them to do whatever it is that they want to do. So both kids have interest in going to college and pursuing things, but we didn't make them make a decision. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? We didn't make our dreams or what we didn't do, try to live through them. And so we encourage our kids to try new things and to be curious and to, do, and, and, and to follow their heart because I think ultimately it'll lead them to where they want to go. So we're, we're very strict parents, meaning we're your parents, but we're also, as we've gone through all this stuff, we've taken a lot of those things, like we don't put expectations on our kids except to be a good, kind human who recognizes you're constantly evolving and to work at being whatever the higher version of yourself is as you go. And so I think that's been really important. Like our youngest son has an interest in science and things. And so we put him in a, in a STEAM school that we drive all the way across the city to take him to and make sure his junior high school he goes to next year supports that as well. Any interest he has, we pour into it. Our oldest son as well. What are you interested in? He has an interest now in um, drawing and animation. He wants to start an animation studio. Like, I don't care if he changes his mind 10 times. I want them to have an experience or that expectation because the reality is this, at 11 years old and 19 years old as my, my oldest son is, we don't have all the answers. You're never going to have all the answers. So have the experiences that help you continue to make better decisions or I don't say better decisions, to continue to have decisions and to have that experience and continue growing in whatever that looks like. I love it. And I... I literally could talk to you all day and I know people can definitely find more about you. Um, so this has been beautiful. Thank you. Coach Tulin. I want to know what you're up to. I know you have a program coming out and you have a podcast. So where can people find you, work with you, get more information on you and your mission? Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, we're doing a sneak peek now, but if you follow me on Coach Tulin on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. Uh, you can find me in all those places. Um, but it's a new um, work. I've been asked for a long time to create a workout program. So I have a new workout program that's coming out. I also have a podcast called Fit Has No Size that was on hiatus for just a moment, um, but we'll be coming back live here shortly. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And keep being you, keep sharing your story. And um, even just talking to you today, it's, it's, fueled more of the fire inside of me to continue being that, um, that trailblazer and rebel of like, that doesn't work for me. I have to create what does. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.